Every now and then, Zechariah gives us prophecies that aren't really just sort of one idea, but rather a rapid succession of images or metaphors all pieced together to sort of produce this cumulating effect of a powerful, majestic coming Messiah. And I think that's what we get in Zechariah chapter 10. Let me read it, starting in verse 1. Ask grain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain, from the Lord who makes the storm clouds, and he will give them showers of rain to everyone, the vegetation in the field. So essentially what is happening here is Zechariah is urging the people to ask the Lord for his abundance. He's the one who can provide the rain. He's the one who provides the storm clouds, not the pagan deities, not Baal, but God himself. So ask the Lord. He's the one who will give all of these things to you. Then the the people chose not to follow after him, but rather chose to go after their own pagan deities. Verse 2. For the household gods utter nonsense, and the diviners see lies. They tell false dreams and give empty consolation. Therefore, the people wander like sheep. They are afflicted for lack of a shepherd. So, the idolaters in the land, they have nothing to offer. They can hold on to nothing, grasp nothing. Even though they entice people with this promise of something that's going to happen, In the end, they're not able to do anything at all. They're completely and totally worthless. The people are lost. So it says that that the people then wander about. It's like they're sheep, but they're sheep without a shepherd. In an agricultural society like ancient Israel, I think this image was even more powerful. Like sheep who just wander. They're, they're going to get themselves killed. They're going to get themselves into terrible, terrible situations. It's not going to go well for the sheep when they don't have a shepherd to lead them. So I think what we see throughout the Old Testament is this shepherd imagery playing a large role in the description of leadership within ancient Israel. Just listen to some of the ways that it's talked about. Psalm chapter 78, it says this in verse 70, he chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheepfolds. Remember, David was a shepherd before he came to be the king over Israel. From following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. In other words, as the psalmist is is describing King David's role in leading Israel, he says that he shepherded the people. In other words, this imagery of shepherding is a metaphor for leadership. How does one do in leading people? Of course, we can't help but think of a psalm like Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I have no want. And so what seems to be embedded in the Israelite consciousness is this idea of leadership tied to shepherding. People are like sheep. They go astray, they need help, they need someone to guide and direct them. And shepherds, those who are entrusted with the leadership of the people, they have a responsibility to take care of the sheep. So what's happening in Zechariah chapter 10 is that the people have trusted in these household gods. They've been seeking out those who offer nothing. And instead of going after Yahweh, Instead of seeking the Lord who can provide the rain and the abundance, like he talked about in verse 1, the people are going after these other gods. How is it possible that God's own people could turn into such uh, wayward sheep? How is it possible that they would not be following God's path and yet be going down all of these other paths? And the reality is because they don't have good shepherds. And that's where we get then in verse 3. The accusations begin here. My anger is hot against the shepherds, and I will punish the leaders. For the Lord of hosts cares for his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them like his majestic steed in battle. God is really angry with those who have been entrusted with the job of leading his people. They've disregarded their responsibility, and instead they just seem to be doing whatever they want. And so these shepherds, those who have been given the very task of leading the people of Israel, have totally neglected their duties, and now God is frustrated about it. 
So what is he going to do? He's going to make his people like a majestic steed in battle. But then verse four, he lists out three different things that are going to come. From him shall come the cornerstone, from him the tent peg, from him the battle bow. So what in the world? I mean, a steed is a daunting image, right? Chapter uh, 10, verse 3, that's, that's an image we can get behind. But then he goes on to list these other three things, a cornerstone and a tent peg and a bow. How are those images of a coming leader or, or what in the world is happening here? Well, I think what's going on is Zechariah is combining images here and, and giving us three images, all of which have become symbols of leadership within ancient Israel. Now, first up is the word cornerstone. Now, our text says cornerstone, but actually in the Hebrew, the word stone isn't there. It's the Hebrew word pina, which just means corner. So from him will come the corner, which sounds even less impressive, right? It's not even a cornerstone, it's just a corner. Uh, what is this possible? What could this possibly mean? Uh, well, I think this comes from Psalm 118. In Psalm 118, you have the psalmist who is sort of um, talking about the ways that God has taken care of him. He seems to be some sort of royal figure, and he goes on and on talking about how, how God has stepped in and taken care of him in his life. He's at several points thought he was going to fall or fail, and yet God seemed to be there to lift him up, to keep him from falling, uh, to protect him. And he talks about some of these enemies that are surrounding him. And then he says, in the name of the Lord, I cut them off. And, and then praises the Lord really for his provision, for all of the ways that he's, he's walked with him through trials and tribulations, and now is carrying him through to success. He then sort of enters through the gates, and it seems as he's coming through the, the gates of Jerusalem, perhaps heading into the temple uh, in order to make a sacrifice. It seems he goes up to the altar at the end of Psalm 118, but as he's on his way, he's sort of recounting the deeds of the Lord, all the ways that, the God, that God has taken care of him and provided for what he needs. And then right there in the middle of it, he uses this proverb, it seems, of sorts. He's talking about how, how some people neglected him or disregarded him, and yet how God's plan has placed him right in the middle of it. And so he says, the stone the builders rejected has come to the head of the corner. The word for corner, pina. In other words, what's happening is, is the stones uh, as the builders are trying to build are, are being chosen, right? The, they're choosing this stone because this fits well and this stone because this fits well. And as they're going about the building process, they've come across this stone and they decide, you know what? This isn't really worth much of anything. It's not really useful. It's, it's shaped oddly. And so they take it and they discard it. They, they reject it. And yet, as they continue their building and they get to the top, maybe they're building an arch and, and they're ready for that middle piece, that, that center piece that sits at the very top. Or, or maybe they're building a wall and they, they need that piece right there to sort of uh, serve as the top of the corner. We're not quite sure what structure that it is that they're building, but the idea is once they get to the end, once they're, they're ready to place this crowning stone on whatever it is that they're working on, they've suddenly realized that it was the stone that they rejected earlier that would be perfect for that role. So the stone the builders rejected, it's come to the head of the corner. And then the psalmist says, the Lord has done this and is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In other words, this day where the, the stone was elevated, where this rejected stone ended up playing a key part in the building process, that's the day that we celebrate. So what the psalmist is saying is that his leadership is actually from the Lord and that God has used in, in this sort of way that only God can. God has used all of his, his slip ups in life and his, his uh, deficiencies and his weaknesses and used all of these things to now point to this greater good, this greater thing that he's doing. What happens then is this sort of becomes an image, I think, that portrays the coming Messiah. The coming Messiah will be this royal figure who will in fact be like a rejected stone. Isaiah will go on to say that the Lord lays a foundation stone in Zion, a tested stone, 
of a sure foundation. So it seems that there's this developing idea that there will come a stone, uh, and that stone, that corner, will in fact be significant. When I, when we run that text through Zechariah chapter 10, I think what we realize is that this is a new type of leader who will in fact be the corner. So Psalm 118 heads into Zechariah chapter 10. But then notice what happens in the ministry of Jesus. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus is, is in these uh, discussions with the religious leaders and, and they're really ready to kill him, right? They wanna, they wanna plot to murder him. And as he, his ministry is continuing and he's, he's entering almost into the last week of his life, uh, he's trying to de determine these things he begins to increase his attacks on the religious leaders. And so in one of the last days that Jesus is on earth, he gives the parable of the wicked tenants in Mark chapter 12. And what's so interesting about this text in Mark chapter 12 is he tells about a vineyard and, and how the owner rejected the, the tenants because they were terrible tenants. And he uh, says, so what will the owner end up doing to those tenants? He'll, he'll come and destroy them. And then he uses Psalm 118, he actually quotes Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected has come to the head of the corner. It's become the cornerstone. The Lord has done it and it is marvelous in our eyes. In other words, Jesus looks at what the religious leaders are doing in his day and he's saying, you all are the terrible shepherds. You are the ones who have rejected me, the divine son, and instead have preferred your own way. I think what Jesus is doing in Mark chapter 12, is he's developing the idea of Psalm 118, which Zechariah picks up on in chapter 10, and then applying it to his own situation. So, Jesus is the corner. Now, the next image here in Zechariah chapter 10 is from him, the tent peg. What's going on with the tent peg? Well, here, I think we have to look at the book of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 22, we find that there's this, this uh, steward over the house of Israel, the steward that is not doing very well. In fact, Shebna uh, has been wicked. And so God decides that he's going to cut Shebna off completely and totally. And in his place, in the place of Shebna the steward, God is going to raise up this individual, Eliakim. And in Isaiah 22, it says that God will place on Eliakim all the weight of the house of David. He'll give him keys over the house of David. What he shuts, no one will open, and what he opens, no one will shut. But then he says he'll fasten him like a firm peg in a hole. And that firm peg placed in that hole will, will uh, hold up the glory of all of the house of Israel. In other words, it's this image, I think in Isaiah chapter 22, of this firm, steadfast peg that stands for the leadership that Eliakim will give over the people. Now, at the end of Isaiah chapter 22, that uh, peg ends up falling because it's just another human being. But I think what we're doing is we're, we're beginning to anticipate, we're beginning to look forward to a coming one who will be firm and steadfast and true. So I think what happens is Zechariah picks up on the image from Isaiah chapter 22 and talks about the the ways that this uh, peg will come as God's uh, sort of uh, judgment against the false or terrible leaders of Israel. Notice then what happens in the book of Revelation. Here in Revelation chapter 3, as Jesus is speaking to the various churches, he has a message for the angel of the church in Philadelphia. It says this, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I think what Jesus is doing is he's actually utilizing the words of Isaiah chapter 22. He is essentially saying, I am the faithful steward. I am the one who is able to to be steadfast and secure and my leadership is a leadership you can trust. I hold the keys and what I do, no one will be able to reverse. Jesus is the one who has been given the power and the authority. And in Revelation chapter three, I think he uses that to demonstrate his, his extreme power over all 
of those who would oppose him. The last image in Zechariah chapter 10 is the battle bow. From him, the battle bow. And this, I think, uh, we could see is is an image throughout the Old Testament uh, used a few times for leadership. Specifically, 2 Samuel chapter 1, we read of the story of uh, uh, the death of Jonathan and Saul. And in this time when, when uh, David is sort of lamenting the death of Jonathan, he uses this phrase several times, the bow, the bow. And it seems that this bow becomes an a image or a symbol for the power of leadership in ancient Israel. What happens then as we get into the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, we find that this image of the bow is used once again. It's talked about as this uh, uh, um, image of power and domination. Uh, and it's this, this bow that is going to, that God is going to raise up against the people. And so as it goes on in Zechariah chapter 9, God is the one who's going to raise up that bow. Interestingly enough, in Revelation chapter 6, it's not used of Jesus, but rather of a Jesus counterfeit. In fact, Revelation chapter 6, it's the opening of the seal. Chapter 6, verse 1. Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come, and I looked, and behold, a white horse, and his rider had a bow. And a crown was given to him, and he came out, came out conquering and to conquer. This white horse is probably not the white horse of Jesus, but rather this sort of counterfeit movement, a counterfeit Jesus instead it intended to look like him. And what image is uh, accompanying this white horse? It's that of a bow. In other words, it seems like this image of a bow was prominent enough in their mindset that that one who came with a bow was sort of coming with this messianic symbol. And so uh, the counterfeit ends up failing. Of course, Jesus ends up prevailing. But I think what we see is that these images are still used in a similar way. And so in Zechariah chapter 10, 10, from him shall come the corner or the cornerstone. From him shall come the tent peg. From him shall come the tent, the battle bow. And then the last one, from him every ruler. I think that sort of encapsulates all of them. All of them together, verse 5, they shall be like mighty men in battle, trampling the foe in the mud of the streets. They shall fight, and then this is the key, because the Lord is with them, and they shall put to shame the riders on horses. God is with this individual. God is with his people as they move forward. And these messianic symbols, I think, all point forward to a greater picture of a coming Messiah. I think what we get here then in, in Psalm 118 and Isaiah chapter 2 and 2 Samuel chapter 1, all run through the lens of Zechariah 10, is a beautiful picture of this mosaic of the Messiah.